Some experts say land is crucial to the resilience of southern Nevada's economy. The latest controversy surrounding a bill that would make more land available to develop. That's this week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt and additional supporting sponsors. Welcome to Nevada Week. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. Land appears plentiful in southern Nevada, but there are federal restrictions on how much of it can be developed. In March of last year, Nevada Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto introduced the Southern Nevada Economic Development and Conservation Act. The bill would make thousands of acres of land available for development, setting aside more than 2 million acres for conservation and outdoor recreation, and returning more than 41,000 acres of ancestral lands to the Moapa Band of Paiutes. If you take a look at this list, you will see the vast support this legislation received from politicians to conservation groups, home builders, and chambers of commerce. However, according to Cortez Masto's office, Clark County pulled its support of the bill, and as a result, that bill is now at a standstill. Joining us to talk more about the situation is Tina Quigley, President and CEO of the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance, John Restrepo, Principal of Las Vegas-based RCG Economics, and Kevin Higgins, Executive Vice President with CBRE, a commercial real estate services firm. Thank you all for joining us. Thank Clark you. County is not commenting on why it has reportedly pulled its support of the bill. Cortez Masto's office told Nevada Week that it is because of a negotiation that she had to make in order to gain bipartisan support. She called it a compromise, which resulted in 24,000 acres of land being made available for development instead of the original 30,000. And John, I know you want to talk about that 30,000 number. There are some differences in that number, but is that also what you believe to be behind the county's withdrawal of support? I, I think part of it was the reduction in, in the land amount, but even then it's not as critical, it's not as important as some people have made it sound. The 41,000 acres in the original bill about 9,000 of that was on hillsides, mountaintops, where you couldn't really develop much anyway. So if you take that out, there was around 31, you know, 30,000, let's say. The new, the new act, uh, the, the, or the compromise, was 25,000. So that's still a pretty significant amount of land for development. So I don't think that was the main thing. What I'm hearing, you know, on the street is that there were other issues like the stripping out of affordable housing language, uh, issues with how rural preservation protect uh, rural preservation lands are going to be dealt with, uh, and there is a right, other language in the bill that the county said, you know, this may not give us what we need, so we need to stop and kind of renegotiate. And so now that as we were talking about earlier, now it goes into next year because now we're in a uh, you know uh, election season, so this this bill won't be talked about again. So in a way, maybe it's better to wait. If we can fix some of these changes that were made at the last minute, the county didn't get a chance to really look at it very closely during this compromise in the uh, National Resource Committee that the Senator Cortez Masto uh, uh, is a chair of. So I think, you know, all things being equal, I think maybe it's better to see if we can improve on it and go around the next time. Tina, is that what you are hearing from the county? So I think that you know, these things are extremely complicated and political, and they're way above my pay grade in terms of how intricate that they become. I think the county was frustrated because they didn't have enough time to thoroughly review the compromise. Um, one of the things that was important to us for economic development purposes was the concept of uh, the Southern Nevada Water Authority's um, horizon lateral, which would bring water and infrastructure to um, the Sloan Gene area, and in particular, there was an industrial park that the county had planned. The language, it sounds so simple, but the language had changed from the feds shall allow this lateral to the feds may allow this lateral. One word, but in, in for legal purposes, a very, very big change. And we'd already known that the, there was pushback from the federal government originally even to have that lateral line in the language. So there's a chance we wouldn't have got it. Um, so like, it was very hard to read, 
when I opened the paper that morning and learned that the language had been pulled or the, the bill had been pulled because for economic development purposes, we need that. It's very important. Um, Explain that more. Why do we need land in order to so, improve the economy? A, you know, a local economy, I always say, is like a lot like a, a, a bucket of money where all the money's just kind of transacting between day, your, your dry cleaner, your daycare, your grocery store, your employer, etc. cetera. Um, but there's always a leak in the butt bucket. The, every time you buy something that wasn't manufactured here or serviced here, that money goes to somebody else's economy. And since we don't grow anything here, we don't manufacture that much here, mostly we're a service, uh, an experiential economy. That's where our big spigot of new money comes in. Um, when that, sometimes that new money dies out, we go through boom and bust cycles. It's not healthy to be solely reliant on one. So we need to be continually bringing in new spigots of money. And that comes in the form of economic growth, um, physical growth, so industrial growth, manufacturing growth, technology, technology companies growth, creative industry growth, healthcare growth. Um, those are all going to, that growth is reliant on, on our landscape. Kevin, you come from the commercial real estate aspect of this. How crucial was this land bill, in your opinion, to Southern Nevada's economy? Well, I agree with John in that rather than make a, a quick decision just to get the bill passed uh, in the county's perspective, why not wait and make it the right decision? I don't think it's an immediate, if we don't get it done for six months or 12 months, that uh, there's doomsday coming around the corner. Uh, I do think on a long-term perspective, it's very obvious we are an island of private land surrounded by public land uh, with not much area to grow privately. So in the long term, yes. And I think we've been talking about what that long-term perspective is to each of us is that in 2035, 2040, et cetera. Uh, and I think there's a few differing opinions on residential versus business parks, industrial parks, et cetera. Industrial parks, commercial real estate, right. how much longer do you think Southern Nevada has of available land? I think that we certainly have, in my opinion, 12 to 15 years easily. Um, I think that uh, the, the municipalities and SNWA have chosen that to be, put their money where their mouth is in Apex with $250 million that they approved a um, year and a half ago, November, uh, to bring it to Apex to make that land uh, developable for new developments, new businesses, new manufacturers, as was alluded to. Um, but you look out there, and if that gets there, and it's supposedly, if the SNWA puts it there, it's January, February of 28, which is still over five years off for that. But you're seeing private and quasi-public uh, partnerships right now bringing in the infrastructure up to different por portions of Apex just beyond the speedway right now in hundreds of acres right now. At the end of the day, you've got at least over 4,000 acres minimal, conservatively, that you can build on, in my opinion, there, um, given the technology we have right now and given the land that's there. Uh, and if you do a conservative building percentage of 35%, that's 55 to 60 plus million square feet alone just in that area of town. So you're saying 12 to 15 years. Yeah. The county says there are about 27,000 acres of Bureau of Land Management land that it can currently sell for residential or non-residential uses. And the county estimates that only would last five to seven years. Do you disagree with his numbers, those numbers? I, 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 a little bit I agree and, and I disagree a little bit. And, and that is that it all depends how you measure the demand for land, right? And, oh, According who, and, to your study, right. it's, it's yeah, a it, huge it, demand. It, it, there is, and, and, and for our, our study that we did in 2020, focused on a segment of that land, and that was any parcels over 20 acres that didn't have more than a 7% slope, because that's the easiest to develop for industrial, and that was near rail and roads and things like that within a certain distance. And so in that context, the, the, and then we measured that against the job growth being produced by this, this uh, UNLV and from GoEd. So there's this whole job growth aspect of this, and that eats up that demand. That's that eats up the bucket, as Tina would say. And so, how much do we have there, and what is the pricing as well? Because as Kevin knows, as you get closer to that a certain point, the land becomes too expensive, mm -hmm. and it may be there but people opt to go to another market because pricing may be out of context, let's say with Phoenix. 
And so there's a variety of factors in place here that create a shortage or, or not. And so a lot of it's pricing, locational decisions that companies want to make, proximity to the, jo the job market, the job shed, for example, that comes into play. So it gets complicated. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue you have to look at so many different components to determine what the true supply of the available land is. What do you want to add, Tina? Well, I do want to, I want to build on something that John said. That, so Phoenix is our primary competitor when it relates uh, to attracting companies that need land. Their, their land costs are cheaper than ours. From what I understand, their construction costs are cheaper than ours. So those are two things that are very concerning. The other thing is we may have this acreage available, but the size of the acreage is concerning. So I think I read that there are about 198, um, 20 acre plus parcels. Generally when a large employer comes in, they're looking for larger than the 20 acres. And we had an employer uh, who was considering Southern Nevada uh, about six months ago who needed over 100 acres of contiguous land. And we only had four parcels in the entire valley that we were able to show them. Um, so they, they did not choose to come here. To talk about the population that is expected to be here in Clark County uh, by 2035, 2.94 million. Population right now, 2.33 million. By 2060, 3.39 million. So a million more people are expected to come. That's according to UNLV's Center for Business and Economic Research, and that drives the demand for land. Did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think from the standpoint of maybe when the study was done uh, a couple years ago, one, we didn't uh, have the infrastructure or the bill passed to bring in the infrastructure into Apex, the 250 million. And so the thought of that being usable in any near term wasn't there. So when people are making decisions to move to Southern Nevada or wherever, three years out is a really long time. Most of our clients that we see, it's maybe 18 months to 24 months, and that's a build a suit, I'm, I gotta be very specific at what I do, et cetera. They don't think much further out. So those lands might have been uh, usable lands that they could power up within that two year period. I can't tell you that today, that turning off of 93 off of Love's truck stop, then in two years you can have a fully capable brand new substation, uh, uh, city or, or county water, uh, and or uh, a sewage system. I can't. 2028 was the date that they're putting onto it. So that might have been a factor in looking at land here uh, to put it to work. You're Again, talking about the apex specifically. Apex. And I want to talk about the infrastructure to the apex, uh, the water line. It's not fully through, it's, it's up to the lower apex, working on the central apex. And if Southern Nevada is granted that uh, Build Back Better regional grant, mm -hmm. that would help facilitate getting water it all the way up there. What is the status of that, Tina? So we've been told that it would, we would hear back by the end of September. Um, we're hoping that it will actually be in the next couple weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot in that grant, if we've received the full grant, that would relate to workforce development for advanced manufacturing as well as infrastructure development for advanced manufacturing, um, which we are, we are geographically well primed for, recognizing our relationship, our I-15 connectivity with Southern California. Yeah. Talking about the bill uh, that is at a standstill, if that land did become available, what would the infrastructure needs be for all of that, similar to the APEX? Well, yeah, in inevitably, and you guys can speak more to it, one of the things that um, ha bringing water out to, th so there would be, I think, 350 acres allocated down in southern the southern I-15 area, the Sloan area, for an industrial park. And if we had that horizon lateral as well, well positioned to start balancing out Apex with a, with a southern alternative as well. You want to add something? Yeah, yeah I was going to say kind of the known unknown in all of this, right, is the question of, for example, you mentioned the population numbers from CBER, uh, Center for Business and Economic Research. Remember, when they do those forecasts, they're not constrained by any kind of natural resource constraints or land constraints or workforce constraints or anything else. They're just looking at historical rate growth, rates of growth and projecting into the future with some adjustments. So the issue of constraints to growth that forget about what the environmentalists want to, want to do or not, are there as well. And so a lot of this, has, so there's a, there's a circle that we're in, right? What is demand? What creates demand? What creates supply of land? What creates the demand? And, and, and from, from that standpoint is 
with all the new, the, the new world we're in post-pandemic, whether it's the water issue, which we haven't done, the, uh, the land issue, the workforce issue, all these things come into play, cost of doing business here issue relative to other markets. That all comes into full in this whole, as I would say, coming from New Orleans, a, a, a gumbo mm -hmm. of things that are going on, right? That we, it, and, and we're trying to project, and, and Kevin nailed it earlier, and that is there, there are issues of time frame and time horizons. The development community is focused on two, two years, three years, maybe at the very, very most. The long-term planners like Tina and I are looking at 10, 15, 20 years. Where do we go from here? And that's where it gets kind of hazy. But we need to start doing that thinking now because it comes real quick. There's 2035 no sounds far away, but it's 2022 there's, there's, already. There's, there's no question that, that all of us at this table are looking out towards the future. And, and don't get me wrong, I think it's a great idea. What I, the message I want to send is we're okay, don't panic right now. Uh, let this, uh, this bill get taken care of. Let it be put in the right perspective. Let certain areas of growth be not just opened up of thousands of acres and you've got no infrastructure, et cetera. Sloan being a good place to start because it's the closest to the infrastructure and closest to the uh, housing, et cetera. But just opening things up will, I think, cause a bunch of other issues right now. And as far as the uh, apex and water and sewer, You've got two, two different uh, entities really working uh, at the sort of the same time. You've got the SNWA and their plans for the water and sewer to bring sewer line in up past 93 and Love's truck stop and then water around the other backside. Main lines to then have everyone connect to and not bring it to every parcel. In the meantime, what you see with Vantage North, 350 acres, uh, Miner's Mesa, uh, the new Las Vegas uh, Boulevard, uh, 150 acres that was recently sold to Prologis, et cetera, and what you're seeing up the Solo Mountain area in Apex, that is driven by private public, nothing to do with SNWA. That is the owners of the land there working with the city of North Las Vegas. It's a totally separate water line, Which no sewer potentially happen in the areas that we're talking about in this bill. I do want to point out, some might argue, Kevin, that you have a vested interest in the apex. Uh, for example, the latest Van Trust industrial project there. Uh, if more land becomes available, land at the apex may not be as expensive as it is. How would you respond to that and your interest in yeah, the apex? You know, uh, I look out uh, typically more than three years. I've been doing this 37 years and I look out five, 10 years in the future. And I was working at Speedway 15 years ago, trying to make the county and the city work together because one had water, one had sewer. We understood the need for infrastructure. We helped get, with RTC's money, uh, the off-ramp at Tropical uh, to then get sewer in there. And that was, that five, last five years you've seen the growth there. That took a long time. So I'm not just looking that short so, term. Well, Kevin, I almost feel like you're making our point for us then, that we actually do need to see land release fairly soon so that we can amp up and be prepared as things are going. I also want to point out that what we think of in terms of Southern Nevada right now with the Bruce Woodbury Beltway and all the growth that we've seen, that would not have happened had we not had a land spill, oh gosh, in 19, 1998. 1998, yeah. yeah. Um, we would have been very constrained. All of that development that is going on occurred because of a land spill. And it's been since 1998 yeah. until we've gotten to this point now. So it, it's not like there's a free for all, like this land is let and then there's a free for all um, in terms of development. There's a lot of, of, of zoning and permitting and I have to planning. No, I have to cut you off there Sorry. because we have a story to go to as we mentioned several conservation groups support the bill that we're talking about in a statement the Nevada Conservation League said in part the act quote offered a thoughtful approach for southern Nevada's future by expanding protections to millions of acres of Nevada's public lands from encroaching development while offering a pathway forward for affordable and sustainable growth and quote the Center for Biological Diversity City disagrees though and spoke with Nevada Week at one of the proposed sites for development. We have about four minutes left. Uh, I'd like to start with affordable housing before infill. You talked about affordable housing as perhaps part of the reason Clark County pulled its support. Well, that, that's part of it too. And I was just listening to what Patrick says. Pat, uh, uh, what Patrick says reminds me of a very, very famous Stephen Colbert saying, he, what he says is truthy. It feels true. 
It's not necessarily true what he's saying. Infield development is important. There's not vast amounts of land in the middle of the Las Vegas Valley for development in terms of if you want manufacturing, warehouse distribution, some of these other things. And it, it's a complex issue. Affordable housing is, is part of that. Affordable housing can go in infill development. It's easier to do it that way. There's zoning issues that we need to take care of. Maybe we need to revisit our zoning laws and building permits and things like that. But what we do know is this. When you look at communities real quickly who are suffering economically, or as Tina said earlier, are stagnant economically, they have environmental issues much greater than communities that balance growth. You have to have balanced growth. You have to provide decent jobs. So if there is not only the physical environment that we have to worry about, but there's a human environment. So they have to be blended together. And so we have to provide benefits to human beings as well as making sure we keep the biodiversity that we need. So the balanced growth, like most of the uh, other environmental groups said, is what we need. Did you want to add something? No, I, I think that, again, part of this is we all are on the same boat as far as getting this done to look out towards the future. There's no question about it. We've got steps to do, county, city, municipality, people like us, to help fill the gaps in the meantime and make sure that the planning for the future is here. Like I said, it took 15 years to plan for the future, and I think it'll take 15 years here to plan out for the future. One thing with the affordable housing, it relates to this, is you have to have the affordable housing for the labor. Otherwise, you can have as many warehouses as you want, mm -hmm. but no workers. So you have to put the two together. I think that's an issue we're seeing with uh, any development south right now is because most of the labor is up north right now, right now. John? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, the, the, I know Tina and I have talked about this for many times. How affordable housing or workforce housing, whatever you want to call it, is a, is, a, is a part of economic development. You cannot have economic development and economic resiliency if we don't provide affordable housing to our employees, which leads to the next question we don't like to talk about too much, incomes and wages, wages. So, wages. Yeah. so you know, the issue of affordable housing also gets tied into what do we pay our workforce? What's the, the skill levels of our workforce, the quality of the workforce, the, the, the wealth gap that we talk about you know, a lot. So there's a lot of components in this. But the point, the good news is at least we're talking about it. At least we're discussing things in a rational way this, in this post-pandemic world that I'll be honest with you, we didn't fully explore after the Great Recession. So now we're, I think, serious about it. Tina, this yeah. bill, I know you said you were upset to see that it didn't pass. You understand maybe it's good to take some time and sure. review it. Have you been talking with the county, perhaps getting them, trying to get them to change their minds? Well, I, I think the county is, is as determined as ever to come up with a bill that works for uh, in the entire the entire region, I, I full, they are fully committed, and they are in conversations with um, with Senator Masto's office. And again, Senator Masto is obviously very, very committed. I think that it, we've just run out of time in terms of, of this congressional year, and it's going to have to go back. No, um, right. But uh, always remember, yeah, with, with scarcity, there's going to be an increase in prices, and so that does make us less competitive as it relates to attracting businesses. And but I do want to go back to this this affordable housing concept. Um, I appreciated very much something that Deborah March said when I, I think it was Amazon wanted to come to Henderson and they said, well, how about we can have some land and we'll, we'll turn a parking lot into affordable housing. And she said, how about you just pay a livable wage? There you go.